This overview, we're going to be talking about the various traits that each of the managerial tiers develop and the corresponding persona that it represents. Personas we're going to be discussing are very closely aligned to the three tiers of management that we have discussed. We have operational level management, essentially the bottom tier, which performs all the tasks to run the current day business operation. We have middle management that essentially we have two uh, groups within that, as we've talked about, post-operational, and let's call it staff. And then we finally have senior management. The personas that are associated with these tiers, for example, are managers, being a manager in the operational level. If you could measure it, you can manage it. Middle managers start to develop the traits associated with leadership. In other words, they, they're starting to learn how to inspire loyalty, how to provide, uh, how to develop the trust into the workforce. And so those represent the traits, if you will, that are molded, that are developed during the, the process of, of working in middle management. And then eventually we get into senior management, where we talk about the, the systemic understanding the mental image and map of what that future world is going to be the ability to see that future environment namely being a visionary so the three personas that an individual can develop over time obviously the first is being a manager and this as as we'll see is historically the easiest of all to become proficient in to become expert in because basically it, it's a matter of understanding the measures and metrics, the understanding the managerial choices, if those measures and metrics are not being met as well. So it's almost mechanical, if you will, in nature. As Peter Drucker said, if you can measure it, you can manage it. Once we move into that middle tier, middle management, here we're, we now are looking at how do we evoke this loyalty? How do we evoke this trust in our subordinates? And this is more so uh, our eloquence. This is more so how we convey. This is more of our interpersonal skills, the words, the terms that we use. And so really, it's a different set of traits because no longer are you, you can measure it, you can manage it. Yes, post-operational managers also use reports, the information systems, to do that. But as we start to slide and migrate towards, if you will, the, the staff positions that eventually will be the, the cadre for senior management, we start to develop this ability, this eloquence, if you will, to convey a sense of trust, to convey a sense of loyalty. And eventually, that small group that uh, becomes senior managers now has gone through these tiers, has understood that if you can measure it, you can manage it environment, has developed the ability to evoke confidence and, and loyalty from their subordinates. Now the key is because of the years of experience that they've had, they now have the systemic capability to look at the environment, not only the current environment and see how it's going to need to be changed, but the future environment and how that future environment is, is essentially Actually trending from today's world. And so these represent, if you will, the persona traits that are, are going to need to be developed as we progress through the various echelons of a corporate environment. The most important trait of a visionary is being able to see the future. Now, obviously, no one can truly see the future, but having enough experience in the industry, having enough confidence in their organization and workforce, having enough systemic skills to be able to look at all the interactions and interplay and be able to craft, if you will, a mental image of what that future is going to be is what we refer to when we say we can see the future. And this is an extremely difficult trait to develop where one has the ability, if you will, to foresee what is going to happen, to essentially understand all the dynamics and interactions that are gonna take place between now and then, to have the judgment to ascertain what will and what will not be successful, and most importantly, the belief and confidence in their vision. A great example of this is John F. Kennedy, as you can see from our slide, John F. Kennedy's speech, Man to the Moon. It was an, a fascinating, if you will, uh, delivery of an individual who had a vision, a vision of the future. 
Now, John F. Kennedy understood all the difficulties that we were experiencing with our Vanguard, Redstone rockets, and the issues that President Eisenhower had with Warner von Braun and the Saturn rocket. But he also understood the importance of the United States landing a man on the moon. And so he crafted a vision, not from being foolish, he didn't craft a vision saying, well, we know we're not going to achieve it. He honestly, truly believed that we would achieve this vision. He inspired the country, if you will, the engineers, the scientists, the organizational structures to participate and to deliver this future environment. He gave the confidence that it could be done. And there are many examples of this. If you ever have an opportunity, you can uh, look at the movie Apollo 13 and the, the NASA uh, can-do attitude that they would bring back, if you will, these astronauts. The key behind it was JFK was truly a visionary. He understood, he saw the future, he saw the need. He was able to anticipate the interactions and actions that would take place. And unfortunately, he was never able to see his vision through its completion. But in July of 1969, men landed on the moon, as you can see the picture. So a visionary is one that has the confidence, the belief that what they envision as the future environment will truly be that future environment. And if you remember from our discussion of the Springfield and Winchester rifles, that really is the a, essence of being a visionary, to be able to foresee that future, to be able to craft a mental image of what that future environment is going to be, to understand how we get from today's world to that future world, and have the judgment to be able to eloquently convey that information, to build the loyalty and the trust, which implies leadership qualities as well. It's extremely important that a visionary also have leadership skills, but not necessary. One can be a visionary and not necessarily have the leadership skills to convey it. And unfortunately, their vision probably will not be carried out. Their vision will not be supported. On the other hand, a leader may not necessarily have visionary skills, may not be able to see that future environment. So the personas that we talk about are, are uniquely individual. That is, we may be a great manager, we may be a great leader, we may be a great visionary, but being one doesn't necessarily imply being the other. As for a leadership, the most important aspect of being a great leader is to inspire trust and loyalty. Now here, an example that, that I'm talking about now on our screen is FDR's Four Freedoms that he uh, gave to his address of Congress in January of 1941. Now, interesting enough, there's another example of not only a leadership capability, but also visionary. Uh, as we understood, FDR understood what was going to be happening, understood the state of the world at that time. And if you remember from your history books, what happened on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? Well, in his vision of the future, in this case, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt understood, FDR understood that that war was going to be coming and wanted to prepare, if you will, the nation that war would be inevitable. At that time, there were many, many in the United States who were isolationists, who did not want to get into another European war, as they called it. And so as a result, the Lindbergh, for example, is one of the leaders of this isolationist movement. And the idea was, let us not get into another European war. FDR, though, understood. He understood that. So what he needed to do was he needed to inspire trust and loyalty. He needed to inspire Congress. He needed to inspire the American people that essentially uh, follow my direction. I know where we're going. Obviously, you also had a vision. So, so even though we talk about these personas being unique, for example, and not necessarily correlated, to have leadership capability will obviously help a visionary. To have visionary capabilities will also obviously help a leader. So they do go hand in hand. It, however, one does not need to be uh, uh, 
qualified or have the capabilities to be the other. But it, it is exceptional when one has both of them. And in this case here, what FDR did, he gave his speech to Four Freedoms, which we see Normal Rockwell in, in his 1943 paintings, uh, are worship, speech, fear, and want. And so as a result of that, he was preparing the United States in this case to say, we are defending not a European war, not an Asian war. We are defending, if you will, foundational freedoms that we believe in. And, and if we do go to war, this is why we're going to go to war, to provide the freedom of worship, to provide the freedom of speech, the freedom from fear, and freedom from what, for example. And, of, and so as a result of that, the key behind it was he was able to build the trust. He, he conveyed the confidence. He crafted the loyalties, and he also had an understanding. So, so as we talk about these personas, we see they essentially overlap in different areas, and and it is as, as, as effective to have been a good manager to be able to be a good leader because you understand it. You may not necessarily have to be a good manager, but being one allowed you to essentially convey this sense of confidence, this sense of trust. Why? Simply because you understood what was going on. And a great example of that in, in the automobile industry in modern times is Lee Iacocca. He was had a tremendous vision. He was the designer of the Mustang for Ford, and then he became president of Chrysler. And he, he conveyed a sense of confidence and of trust and of loyalty because everyone understood, as they called him, he was a car guy. He understood the industry. He understood the vertical market. He was able to uh, mentally manage and, and envision the future environment. And he also was able to, to convey this sense of loyalty and confidence and trust. Thus, his subordinates followed him. So these are characteristics that are extremely important. And yes, they are mutually exclusive in one respect, but they also overlap in another. And effectively, the tier structure of an organization helps us develop these, starting out, if you will, with the managerial operational levels, moving into the middle management, leadership skills that one develops, and eventually into senior management visionary uh, traits that we need to develop. Lastly, we talk about the first tier of an organizational structure, essentially being a manager. Now, as I mentioned, being a manager is effectively a more mechanical perspective. And over time, one develops the expertise, the experience to do what? Very simply, to be able to understand the reports that they are monitoring, to understand the measures and metrics that are being used, and to understand that if those metrics are not being achieved, then what are our managerial options? What do we do? You know, the example I've given many other times before, I'm managing a cereal box assembly line, and all of a sudden the cereal is overflowing the boxes. Well, what are my managerial choices? Well, the first choice is to stop the assembly line so I don't continue this failure. And then I have to look at a series of checklists, whatever the case may be, to ascertain what is going on. So the traits and skills I learn, and in Important to understand, these traits and skills are vertically oriented. So if I'm producing computers, if I'm producing software, I'm producing automobiles, the primary activities are essentially different. As I mentioned, Lee Iacocca, quote unquote, was a car guy. He designed the Mustang for Ford. So he understood all the elements associated with the automobile industry. So as a manager, according to Peter Drucker, if you could measure it, you can manage it. And really what that meant was we as managers in the operational tier of an organization and also post-operational to some degree, we monitor the measures and metrics. Where do we monitor them? We monitor them on the reports as we discussed type one, type two types of, of reports that we have. We understand what the measure tells us. We understand what the ROS means. We understand what the GM means. We understand what uh, uh, market share implies and so on. We understand what that measure is. We then also understand for our specific vertical industry, the metric. 
And then we need to be able to understand the various managerial choices that we have in case we are not achieving those metrics. We tie all of this together and what we have is managerial skills. So as you can see, we go through the various routines. Some of these are primary uh, business processes, which are vertically oriented. The rest of these are horizontal or supporting uh, secondary type of business activities. And our goals are as managers in each and every one of these functional areas is to be able to monitor the measures and metrics and the necessary then manage. So really that's what we're learning. That is the skill that we're developing. We're developing the skill to make sure we select the appropriate measures, we select a, a valid set of metrics, and then we understand the various choices that we have. So in this case, if you can measure it, you can manage it. And this is the first tier. This is the operational tier. And it also is the, the most important one because it provides, if you will, middle and senior managers with the foundational skill sets, experiences that are necessary in the vertical industry. Again, I could be playing football, very different skill sets and very different strategy than if I'm playing baseball, than if I'm playing soccer. Same thing holds true if I'm producing automobiles, very different than if I'm producing trucks, very different than if I'm producing television sets and stereo systems, very different than if I'm producing white goods, appliances like refrigerators, for example, and stoves and so on. The vertical skill sets we developed are going to allow us as we migrate up, develop the confidence to become, develop the familiarization, to develop, if you will, the understanding of the industry. And this as a leader will allow us to essentially, when we speak, convey the trust that we need. And as a visionary, this vertical industry expertise will allow us to have a mental image of that future that we can truly say is based on the experiences we have had in the trenches, based on the experiences we have had in the operational environment. So thus, as we begin our walk through the echelons of a corporation, the operational level is so important for us to become experts in understanding the delivery of the products and services. And also understand that five, 10 years later, once we become senior managers, we may not necessarily understand all the nuances of today's production environment or per day's, uh, today's business processes they're associated with simply because of change in technology and so on. But we do have an appreciation of the end results. We do have an appreciation of the deliverable. Thus, the tiered structure of an organization is not only developed to effectively deliver the products and services of a corporation and to manage the organization, it also is developed to essentially provide us with the experiences we need in each and every one of these echelons, in each and every one of these tiers, to essentially craft a persona that we're going to need as we move into the next tier and as we move into the next tier. So essentially starting out at the operational level, the experiences we developed in the vertical industry will help us become better leaders, the familiarization, the confidence that we have will essentially help us become better visionaries. So we develop and we fine tune these traits as we migrate through the various tiers of a corporate environment. We develop the ability to understand the measures and metrics, to understand the actions that one takes, to understand the vertical industry, to understand how to convey loyalty, not only because we understand the industry, but we also have the interpersonal skills that we develop to essentially provide confidence in our decision making to our subordinates, to instill trust in them, that our belief systems, that we truly believe what we are stating is valid and true, our judgment, our systemic perception, our foreseeing the future, all of these traits, all of these uh, persona traits are essentially developed, are fine-tuned, are, are, are crafted as we migrate through the various tiers of a corporation. So not only is the organizational structure designed to effectively and efficiently develop and deliver the products and services of a corporation, of a firm, but it also enables us to essentially provide the experiences over time that are required to effectively develop these traits. 
And it's important to remember, as a team, if we want to go fast, we go alone. But if we want to go far, we go together. And that's why we have the organizational structure we do have. And that's why the personas and the traits associated with each of these personas is developed as one progresses through this echelon.